yeah good morning we'll begin um so we've been going through various doctrines last class which doctrine did we cover yes it was the doctrine of christ um so this week we will uh, look into the doctrine of salvation like i said you know we are not following the same order uh, which your notes has um so today we will be covering the doctrine of salvation separately um yeah maybe we'll look at doctrine of salvation and justification next class we will look at um, uh, doctrine of redemption and sanctification so that's the way we would be covering it all right so um to get started off with the doctrine of salvation and justification um, a lot of people think of salvation in different ways for some that word salvation it may mean um i don't know going and meditating somewhere on a mountain in the hope that some enlightenment will come for some people the word salvation it may mean um somehow breaking free from the cycle of life and death for many christians the word salvation means uh, getting a free ticket to heaven uh, so different people have different views of what salvation is uh, but what does the bible say about what salvation means so according to the bible basically it's two things it is deliverance from slavery to sin and it is entry into a new relationship personal relationship with god so that is actually what salvation is according to the bible first you are delivered from slavery to sin and second uh, you are now able to enter into a new personal relationship with god who is no longer looking upon you with judgment but who is willing to accept you with love that would be actually uh you know salvation so someone who comes um uh so salvation is basically two things it is deliverance from slavery to sin and second it allows you to enter into a personal relationship with god who is no longer looking upon us with judgment but is looking upon us with acceptance and peace and love so it is basically these two things that salvation is so you know when we have an altar call and people put up their hands just because they think okay i'm going to get a free ticket to heaven and they're not really understanding the real implications of what is involved they may have a true conversion experience in their hearts or they may not depending on how open they are to these actual to these two actual factors if there's an openness in their heart to really give up their sinfulness to be delivered from the slavery to sin if that desire is there then yes you know god would respond to them on the uh, also if there's a real desire for them to you know connect with the lord get to know him you know um place themselves under his protection then yes it it works but if you're just standing over there and saying oh i want a ticket to heaven chances are that you know you may not really have a true salvation experience if you if you go to the you know for the altar call with that kind of an attitude so salvation is basically deliverance from slavery to sin and having a restored relationship with god so um the salvation experience as such is something that we uh, go through our entire lives um when we first come to the lord and make that initial commitment uh, to him you know to live for him to trust in him to submit to him at that moment you could call that the initial conversion experience where you were part of the world you were a slave to sin but now you have been uh, converted you have been changed now you are a part of his family so maybe you could call that uh, the initial conversion experience and then for the rest of our earthly lives we will go through what we call the sanctification process so that would be the second uh, phase of uh, the salvation experience where you go through sanctification on a daily basis where god makes you more and more uh, like christ and then uh, the final portion of our salvation experience is when we go to heaven and then we share in christ's glory 
there is glorification so we could say that salvation has got three phases three stages the initial conversion experience where you have your encounter with the lord jesus and then god forgives you of your sins and a whole bunch of things happen a whole bunch of divine things happen in that instant in that moment when you make that con uh, make that commitment to jesus uh, so all that would be involved in your initial conversion experience and then you go through a lifetime of sanctification where you are working out your salvation it doesn't mean that you're trying to earn salvation that phrase working out your salvation basically means now you're learning to apply that salvation to your life you're growing into it uh, you you know you're you're enjoying more and more of this salvation experience so that's a uh, experience of sanctification that takes place over your entire lifetime and then uh, once we get there to heaven that is when there is glorification where um, uh, now you have uh, um, entered into god's presence and there you will now share in his glory because while on the earth you were willing to share in his sufferings so we we go through this conversion sanctification and glorification stages in our christian walk uh let's look at one scripture and get started with that uh ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9 so if someone could read out ephesians 2 8 to 9 a very familiar passage. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Okay, so it says over here that uh, salvation is given freely by the grace of God. We do not deserve to be given salvation, but by grace, freely, even though we don't deserve it, it is being given. So by grace, we have been saved. And... Um, this grace, this free grace, this free salvation is given to anyone who chooses to place their belief, their trust in Jesus Christ. So it's given to everyone who has this faith in Jesus. And also it says, um, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so God gives this gift of faith. God gives this ability to believe to those people who are open to uh, you know what he is offering so we saw that we have uh, you know there's a slight overlap even as we keep covering all these doctrines so we, these are familiar concepts which we have touched upon earlier so we saw in john 16 you know 8 where it talks about the role of the holy spirit and we looked at how he is the one who convicts us of sin righteousness and judgment so those believers who are open to what is being uh, you know um, uh, not, not believers, unbelievers, the unbelievers who are open to the work of the Holy Spirit, who are responding uh, to his convicting work, who are willing to hear what he has to say. So for such people, he gives them the gift of faith to be able to believe in Jesus. And then they make that personal commitment. And once they do that, you know, they have the salvation experience. So all of these things uh, take place uh, through the initiative of God. God takes the first, first step. He's the one who begins his work of conviction. And then when people are open to that work of conviction, he gives the gift of faith to be, in fact, even be able to believe in Jesus. And then once we place our faith in Jesus, then, you know, the salvation experience happens. Um, if we could also maybe read out Romans chapter 10, verse 20. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. Okay, so um, here God talks about how he took the first step, how he chose to reveal himself. 
to those who were not even you know uh, seeking so he is the one who does his work of conviction in our hearts and people who are open to receive that they are the ones who are given this gift of faith to believe in jesus and that's when the salvation experience takes place so god takes the initiative he is the one who calls us to salvation so uh, it, it all begins with a call to salvation and an invitation to salvation that uh, you know god himself gives us um so uh, if what exactly is this call to salvation so when when god is calling his people to salvation what is the invitation that he gives does he say you know come to me because i have free tickets with me available for heaven is that the invitation that he gives what is the kind of invitation that jesus actually gives when we say salvation uh, an invitation to salvation what exactly does that invitation involve what does it sound like because sometimes when we go to a meeting and uh, you know we 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 are sitting over there and we listen to the uh, person who is preaching we get the impression that salvation the invitation which is being given is come you will get a ticket to heaven come you will be blessed come all your problems will go away come god will you know do this 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 for you so we kind of get that as the invitation but actually what is the invitation which the bible says what is the invitation that actually god makes to his people you know if we were to look at matthew 11 um in fact you would have to maybe look at the entire chunk from verse 20 up to verse 30 to really get a picture of what is the real salvation invitation so matthew chapter 11 uh, maybe we could have someone read out just uh, verse 20 yeah only verse 20 matthew 11 verse 20 then jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles have been performed because they did not repent okay so over here it's talking about uh, how jesus begins to condemn the the towns which are not receiving his message um, they are uh, not showing any signs of repentance so the entire uh, salvation process has to begin with this repentant attitude in the heart where you are no longer satisfied with your sinful attitudes uh, but rather you know you wish to be changed so jesus begins his entire talk about salvation by touching upon repentance upon the topic of repentance he points out that the first thing is people should want to repent of their sinfulness and then later on you know he talks about he, he condemns all those towns which are not uh repenting and then in when when you come to Matthew 11 28 to 30 uh you have the rest of the invitation salvation invitation being given so if we could read out Matthew 11 verses 28 to 30 come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light okay, so if you were to take the entire passage all the way from matthew 11 verse 20 and come all the way up to verse 30 we see what salvation is actually about jesus is saying you have been living in sin but that is not the way to live i am asking you to repent i'm asking you to turn away from your old lifestyle and i'm asking you to come to me if you come to me then i will give you rest i will show you a different way to live i'm asking you to take up my yoke and start putting that on on, on your shoulders rather than living in your own way learn from me submit to me allow me to teach you how to live a new and different life and you will discover that your souls will find much rest because my uh, invitation which i am offering the yoke which i am offering is actually not very heavy it is light 
so this is the salvation invitation over here there's no mention of a free ticket to heaven over here there's no mention of you know i'll be your santa claus and just pour blessings upon you it is a very very different salvation invitation where jesus is saying repent of the life you have been living so far come to me i will show you a different way of life submit to me learn from me i'm very gentle in the way i teach i'm i, I know i i will show you much kindness and mercy and i will help you to live this new way of life that is the invitation to salvation so if a person responds to that and says yes i trust in this jesus i i know i want what he is offering they are the ones who who experience a true salvation experience uh, the rest of them may be under the impression that they have become believers but uh, you know if they have not really made that commitment then um, they are not believers in the true sense of the word you know they still need to be saved uh, so uh, when when a person actually comes to the lord and makes that initial commitment they may not have this much clarity about all that is involved but at least that one basic thing must be there in their heart that yes i do not want to live in sin anymore and jesus is offering me a better life i want that at least that one little bit of you know um uh um, desire and that one little bit of awareness that they are leaving behind a sinful lifestyle and making a commitment to Jesus that at least should be there if that awareness is also not there then it's not really at all a true commitment okay so um uh, what we are discussing today is like you know has to do with eternal life and death so it's a very very important topic that we are in fact touching upon so it's so important how we preach salvation to people if we are going to be people who are just going to go to people and say oh, you know what you come to jesus believe in him and you will uh, you know um, be able to enter heaven uh, come to jesus and believe that he will you know give grant you healing and grant you blessings then you know you you will receive salvation that's a very superficial message we would have to give a true gospel invitation you know then people will know what they are actually accepting what they are coming to jesus for it is very very vital that we present the gospel in the correct manner now just to look a little more upon this call to salvation that jesus makes he uses a parable to kind of bring out uh, what he wishes to convey and we see that parable in matthew chapter 22 verses 1 to 14 Matthew 22:1 to 14 is where Jesus talk, you know uses the example of a wedding banquet that a king is you know um uh, throwing for all the people for all the people that he is inviting so he invites a lot of people for this wedding banquet and um um you know we if we, you know, those of us who are familiar with the parable we see that the people who were invited originally they are not interested they don't wish to come for the banquet and uh, if we were to look at what jesus was indicating we know right he was basically talking about the jewish community many of the jewish people were not interested in what he was offering he is giving this call to salvation but they are not interested in responding and so then what does he do he throws open the invitation to everyone else the gentiles so that's that's what we see in the uh rest of the parable where the uh, the servants of the king they go into all the side lanes and they go down the roads and they go into all the uh, places which are generally not visited and they start calling all the people and say come come you are also now invited to the wedding banquet so that's basically what we see in this parable where the initial in- invitees were not interested in what jesus was offering and jesus throws open the invitation to everyone and says whoever wants to come you know and it talks about all the different kinds of people who come people who are unqualified maybe to come for a royal a wedding you have the poor you have the lame you have the blind you have uh, all kinds of people coming in and not all of them would be you know wonderful godly saintly persons so the invitation is open to anyone anyone who's interested it doesn't matter how uh, unqualified they are doesn't matter how rotten they are it it's just an open invitation for everyone and so a lot of people come and you know they they come into the wedding uh, banquet and they're all you know enjoying the feast that is over there 
and then it says in the parable that one man was present over there who was not wearing the wedding garments which were given to each of the guests and this person is not wearing the wedding garments and he you know is thrown out of the banquet so the only condition being laid is when you come to accept the invitation accept it in the way that i am asking you to accept it so it's the, the jesus is not saying you know only certain people with certain qualifications can come to me he is not saying that yeah uh, it is open to anyone who wishes to come but when you come you got to accept him in the way he is asking for you know so if you follow that then you and you have a true salvation experience uh, and uh, so over here maybe we could you know compare this wedding garment to the robe of righteousness which jesus christ would give so whom is he going to be giving this to so um yeah and the last you know the la very last portion of that um parable uh, maybe we could actually look at those two verses at the end matthew chapter 22 verses 13 and 14 matthew 22 uh, 13 and 14 then the king told the attendants tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness there where there will be weeping and gashing of teeth for many are invited but few are chosen okay that's the final sentence uh, in that parable many are invited but few are chosen so the invitation is open to everyone in the world you know it says in the other scripture in another scriptures that jesus came as a ransom for all so the invitation is open to all but only those who choose to come to him and choose to repent they are the ones who will be given the robe of righteousness so anyone who is not wearing no not covered in jesus christ's robe of righteousness who is not covered literally in his righteousness in his perfection who is not clothed in his perfection they would be you know thrown out so many are invited but very few are chosen who are the chosen few the ones who were willing to repent and say yes i want your righteousness lord and i am willing to take up your yoke learn from you you know to walk in a new way of life a holy way of life turning your back completely on the old sinful lifestyle that you once had so this is what is involved in true salvation um so uh, yeah go ahead like uh, the one who are uh, cloth uh, were in righteousness of jesus they are only invited right like mm -hmm. they are they are the chosen the one, not they, they invited they are the chosen everyone. Yeah, I'm sorry. They are the chosen who yes. are in. But if we see, ah, uh, when we confess, ah, uh, like when we believe in Jesus by faith, we are already made righteous with Him. So, like, even ah, uh, when, for example, people who as a uh, invitation, ah, uh, they are also keep their faith in Jesus. So, they are also kind of, ah, uh, they are also being righteous with God, right? Jesus. But how can we differentiate that? So, ah. Uh... we are talking about people who have not yet become believers unbelievers when they just first start feeling that conviction of the holy spirit within inside their hearts at that time they are convicted of sin righteousness and judgment they are convicted that they are sinful people that on their own whatever they do is not enough they need a savior who can save them so they are convicted of sin they are convicted of righteousness and they are convicted of judgment that if they do not accept what jesus is offering then all that they have to look forward to is hell and judgment so G the holy spirit starts do doing this work of conviction it may happen at a at a salvation meeting it may happen when someone is listening to a sermon it may happen when someone is reading the bible it may happen on different occasions but in that moment that person begins to kind of understand why they need jesus and coming to jesus means saying no to whatever they were living with earlier they would have to say a full put a full stop to that and say from this moment i am starting a new walk so they are placing their faith in jesus and 
hoping that he will now help them so with that attitude when they come to him in that moment the salvation experience takes place so uh, so i meant faith in that sense where they are trusting jesus to help them and i meant repentance in that sense where there's at least that little bit of awareness that jesus is expecting me to stop doing whatever i was doing up to now and from now on he is saying i need to walk with him and submit to him so those elements will be there in the salvation experience of each person though they may not be aware of the entire full doctrine of salvation at the moment of you know of coming to the jesus but at least these basic things should be there in their heart then it becomes a true salvation experience in that sense so um, you know um, this the the technical term that is used is conversion of course in our in our india the term conversion has got an entirely different implication uh, but generally you know people who were not even aware of uh, india and uh, the, the the political scenario over here when they just think of the word conversion uh, as a theological term they are basically thinking of two things so one would be repentance and the other is faith in jesus christ conversion involves two basic things first it involves repentance second it involves faith in jesus christ uh, if someone could read out matthew chapter 3 verses 1 to 2 this is the you know the first portion the repentance part of it matthew 3 1 to 2 in those days john the baptist came preaching in the wilderness of judea and saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is the is at hand okay so uh, this is this has always been the first portion of the um, conversion talk conversion basically has to involve repentance because the kingdom of heaven is now open the gates are open ready to receive people but you need to repent if you repent then yes you can actually enter through those gates okay so repentance you know uh, like we have seen in the earlier sessions or did we see in the earlier sessions or not can't remember but yeah repentance is basically a godly sorrow oh why did i live in the way that i did why have i dishonored god why have i behaved in this shameful manner so it's a godly sorrow where you're saying enough is enough i do not want to live any more like this from now on i want to have a new and different life and jesus is promising me that so this repentance is godly sorrow for the way you have lived so far and you think enough no longer shall i live in sin i want to have a fresh start so that would be basically be, you know true repentance so this person is now ready this person is responding to the convicting work of the holy spirit and they're ready to start off a new chapter in their lives there's something that's actually going on inside such persons you know when they place their faith in jesus the holy spirit will give them that gift of faith to be able to believe in jesus and they will do it in that moment and in that moment a whole bunch of divine things which cannot be humanly done are done by god for us and we become part of his family okay so um, so the first portion of true conversion will be repentance and the other portion is faith in jesus christ we we'll look at a couple of verses you know which talk about that uh, john chapter 14 verse 6 if someone could read out john john chapter 14 verse 6 jesus answered i am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me okay jesus is very very clear about this he says having faith in a hundred different things is not going to help you you need to have faith in me that only through me can you come to the father so this one basic fundamental piece of faith is absolutely essential to your salvation experience you got to believe that only through jesus christ can i come to god the father there is no other route there is no other way this becomes one very very fundamental piece of faith that a person would need to have we have we have something very similar mentioned even in romans chapter 10 
verses 9 and 10. If someone could read out Romans 10 um, verses 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness and the mouth confession is made to salvation. Yes, Le and 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 uh, so we uh, so the see the other aspect of conversion first is repentance, the other is faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when we say faith in Jesus Christ, we are talking about two aspects of faith. So here we in John fourteen six and in Romans ten nine to ten, we saw that we need to believe that only through Jesus Christ believing that he is the son of god he is the only one who can save us that is is what it, um, you could say that is your at your thinking level at your mind level you place your belief your faith in him and say yes only through jesus am i going to be saved so you confess that with your mouth because you know at your mind level you have now accepted that fact there's another aspect of faith which is the personal trust which you place in him, where you are now submitting your entire life to him. So you see, at the mind level, you have understood the concept. You have understood that only through Jesus, salvation is going to come. But it goes beyond just that mind understanding. It comes to a personal commitment. Out of your thinking, out of what you have now understood, you choose to actually act out and place your entire life at his feet and say, yes, from now on, I choose to follow you. So there's a personal aspect also of faith involved, where now you're submitting your entire life to him. Um, if we can look at John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. Yet to, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So who are these people who have become the children of God? They are the ones who received him. They have fully received him into their life saying, okay, Lord, now you be Lord and master of every area of my life because I trust you. I don't just believe in you at a mind level. I actually believe you in my personal experience. I'm willing to give up all of myself to you and trust you. So this is you acting out your personal trust and submitting yourself to him. Um, and then, um, yeah, in Acts chapter 10, verse 43 and 44, that's basically your passage where, you know, um, uh, Peter has gone to Cornelius' household and he's uh, sharing the gospel with all the people who have gathered over there. And he's talking to them. And he says to them, you know, you need to believe in him. So over there, he's not talking about just the mental level of acknowledging and saying, oh, yeah, Jesus is the way to salvation. This one step further. He's basically telling that entire household, are you willing to completely come under Jesus covering and totally submit to him? No longer will you be following the Jewish customs. But from now on, you see, because the Cornelius family, what is the term that is used in the acts for uh, um i mean the, the, this was the category of people who are from a gentile background and they have chosen to convert to um um i had my bible open i could have just looked up the term yeah so uh, these are the uh, gentiles who have chosen to now you know believe that yahweh is the true god and they have stepped into the jewish faith but now peter is coming and saying it's Jesus is the one who is the way to salvation. Uh, what is that? A, a God, um, God follower or something. That's the term, you know, in our uh, in our Bibles, NIV and all of that. That's what this this Cornelius was when it says, you know, that he was a God follower or something. That's the term that is used for people. Uh -huh. You know, this I'll I'll, I'll look it up later. Um, so um, so. So now this person is being told it's not enough for you to have come into the Jewish faith. You need to actually place your faith in Jesus Christ. Are you and your family willing to actually do that? Because when you do that, there's going to be opposition. The Jews are not going to be happy. They will say, why have you now become a follower of this Jesus? 
why have you turned your back on the jewish uh, you know faith into which you have stepped in so they're going to be saying all of that are you willing to make that commitment so um, if you can if you could just read out acts chapter 10 verse 43 acts 10 verse 43 Acts 10, 43, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Remission of sins. Yeah, it says that whoever believes in him, it's not just believing about him. So it's not enough if Cornelius and his household sit over there and say, oh yeah, salvation is through Jesus. Even the demons know that. The demons also nod their heads and say, yeah, salvation is through Jesus. So just that knowing at this mind level is not sufficient. You go one step further and you make a personal commitment of trust and say, I now choose to submit my entire life to this Jesus and live under him. That becomes personal faith. It's not just intellectual belief. It becomes personal faith. And uh, so in that moment, even as Cornelius and his household are listening to this sermon, you know, when, it, when they are told everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness, they actually begin to believe that. And then in that moment, when that commitment happens, it says in the next verse, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Now, that's what happens in a true salvation encounter where that person has been open to the conviction, open to what God is telling about Jesus Christ. And in that moment when they believe, in that moment when they submit and say, OK, from now on, you are going to be my Lord. In that very, very moment, the Holy Spirit comes down upon the person. That is when they are born again into the kingdom of God. And from that moment onwards it's a whole new life you know uh, so um, there's a lot which actually happens during a true salvation experience so you and i who are going to be going out and sharing the gospel please let us present the salvation invitation the way jesus presented it we're not, we, we should not be casual in the way we talk about the gospel. We should not reduce it to a free ticket to heaven. And we should most certainly not say, come to him and he'll take away all your problems and give you blessings. Because when people come with that wrong expectation, and then you have all the trials and difficulties of the Christian life coming, then they wonder, oh, what is this? We came over here for something else, and we are being given something else. And it's not at all a true faith. So. Um, here, Cornelius and his household, they choose to believe in what is actually being offered, uh, you know, the forgiveness of sins through the name of Jesus, and they want that. And, uh, and even as they begin to believe, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they are all uh, saved. So, you know, just to kind of wrap up what we have been saying about conversion, I may be very, very repentant of my sins. You know, I've kind of looked at myself and I'm ashamed of who I am, the way that I have been living, and I'm very re deeply repentant. So I turn my back on all the sins I have repented, and then I go sit on a mountain and I start meditating and waiting for enlightenment to come. You see, you see I have taken that first step of repentance, but the se second step which I have taken is I'm trying to use some other method to attain salvation. I do not get saved. Repentance has happened, true repentance. I'm never again going to go back to all the sinful things that I was doing. I have repented, I've turned away. But now I believe that if I go sit on that mountain and meditate, enlightenment will come upon me. My Atman will be you know, united with something else or whatever, and you know, I'm going to get salvation. So you see, just repentance alone does not lead to salvation. I may be a person who's very repentant of the evil lifestyle I have lived, and I give up all of that. I repent of all of that. And now I dedicate my entire life to serving the poor. All my money, all my time is used to serving the poor. But I have not received salvation. I have genuinely, truly repented. But I'm looking to, you know, serving the poor as my means of getting salvation. It's not going to happen. So just having that one component of repentance is not enough. In the same way, if I'm a person who says, yes, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. But I don't give up 
my old sinful lifestyle. So now in the second example that I'm using, I believe in Jesus. I have no doubt about it. I know that Jesus is God. But I have not given up my sinful lifestyle. I have no desire to give up those things. So if that is the case, again, it is not salvation. I do not have a salvation experience. So you need to have both. I, I need to repent of my sinfulness. Second, I also need to place my faith that in Jesus, that he alone is the way to the Father. And I will submit all of my life to him, take up his yoke and learn from him. When both of these components come together, only such people are truly saved. So that is when actual conversion you know, takes place. And in that moment, something called regeneration happens. A new birth takes place. The person is born again. So from that true conversion experience, you move into what is called regeneration. OK, so um, uh, let me just take a look at the, you know, the, the things that are posted over here. Okay, the first question was regarding the you know um, portion for the assessments. So whatever we had done up to the last class, uh, doctrine of Christ, those are all the things which are mentioned in the um, you know in the multiple choice questions. So all the things that were covered up to the last class, you know, this is for the online people, the multiple choice questions. So uh, up to doctrine of Christ, whatever was covered. All those things are there mentioned in those uh, multiple choice questions. So whatever we are covering today is not part of the multiple choice questions which have been posted uh, in the Google Classroom. Um, regarding this question about people who sin again and again, uh, if it is unbelievers who are sinning again and again, uh, they anyway do not have the salvation experience. So they are anyway under judgment. But if we are talking about people who are sinning again and again, after salvation, uh, you know, um, then uh, if they have reached a stage where they do not even feel any repentance for what they are doing, then it means that they have crossed beyond, you know, any hope of repentance. So Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10 would apply to such believers who have, you know, where it talks in detail about in Hebrews chapter 6 about how they have shared in the Holy Spirit, how they have tasted of the gift of salvation, how they have, you know, uh, known God, uh, how they have experienced the powers of the coming world. They have done all that, but they have now turned away and gone back into the world. And it says over there that for such people, it is impossible for them to turn back to repentance. So Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10 would apply to such people who after the salvation experience have chosen to continue living in sin, uh, you know, on a habitual, regular continuous level to an extent where they finally one day reached a point where there is no desire to follow the Lord. There is no desire to really repent. They still desperately want the heaven ticket. They don't want to lose that. But there's no, no more repentance left inside. There's no, not even a slight spark of wanting to come back and honor him. No feeling ashamed of what they have done. All that is gone. All that, the, all that there still remains is this longing to have that heaven ticket. So we, if you cross that point, Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10 say that you have now gone beyond being able to repent. So uh, that would apply to such people. Um, yeah. So uh, maybe just to you know, get started on this whole um, you know, concept of regeneration, um, what exactly does it involve? When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he says to him, it is not enough for a person to be born into the physical world, uh, but it is also necessary for them to be born spiritually into the spiritual world, you know, into the kingdom of God. So uh, the first birth which all humans undergo is the physical birth into the human world. Uh, but there's, there's a second birthing experience that they have to go through 
and that will be when they choose to be born into god's kingdom so that second um, you know birth is required if anyone wants to be in the presence of god you know uh, eternally so um, if we could you know read uh, john 3:3 3, 3, which talks about that in reply jesus uh, declared i tell you the truth no one can see the kingdom of god unless he is born again okay, no one can see the kingdom of god unless they are born again and why he explains in verse 6 if you could read out 36 6 also yeah verse 6 flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit okay so uh human flesh can only give birth to a human but on the other hand the holy spirit can give birth to a new spirit so uh, when when a baby is born the human mother is just giving birth to a human child but when the holy spirit gives birth to this uh, to a new person you know uh, that that person uh, receives a brand new uh, you know uh, spirit so there are two kinds of birth involved and only a person who has undergone both you know both births is able to be in the presence of god and do uh, we understand that right because when the when the mother gives birth to the little baby uh, you know um, the sinful nature which she had inherited from her father uh, and uh, she now uh, you know the, the sinful nature is passes on to the child because her husband also has a sinful nature so that gets passed on to the child so the child is born uh, alive physically but in in the in the, in, in its spirit that little baby has a spiritually dead spirit uh, uh, a spirit that is disconnected from god a spirit that is not in union with god so that little baby is born physically alive but spiritually dead now something else has to happen when that child grows up and has an encounter with god that child responds to the convicting work of the holy spirit and the child receives the gift of faith from the holy spirit to trust in jesus and submit its entire life to him when that happens at that moment the holy spirit births a new spirit a spiritually alive spirit inside that person and that is when that person and is now born into the kingdom of god so that is the second birth that they would have to go through without that no one can enter into the kingdom of god like you know very plainly jesus says over here if we could just look at one more uh, a couple of scriptures um titus 3 verse 5 Titus uh, chapter three was five. He saved us not because of right. He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So, how does a person actually get reborn? You know, it talks about the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. these are things that we looked already at when we were looking at romans chapter 6 where it you know talks about how this washing of rebirth takes place how the renewal by the holy spirit takes place so those are things which need to happen divinely inside a person only then can they actually call themselves a believer so we when we come back from the break we'll again touch upon this very familiar concept this is something we have already looked at but you know we will just again repeat it and then you know move on to other things so um uh, if we can all log back in at uh, 9 uh, at yeah 10 o'clock yeah thank you